everyone. So this is a short video on the Gibbs face rule and an example of how you would use that in metamorphic PT diagrams. So this link that I've linked down below is a pretty useful resource to go back to if you need to try and understand Gibbs face rule. So Gibbs face rule is expressed by the formula P plus F equals C plus two, where P is the number of phases in the system, C is the minimum number of chemical components required to constitute the phases in the system, and F is the degrees of freedom in the system. So this is also referred to as variance of the system. When we talk about phases, a phase is any physically separable material in the system. So every unique mineral is a phase, and this is including polymorphs. As we've looked at in our lectures, we've had the polymorph of Al2SiO5, where we have kyanite, andalusite, and silimonite. So each one of these would count as its own phase. Okay, so another example of unique phases are igneous melts, liquids, and vapor. And it is possible to have two or more phases in the same state of matter. So you can have solid mineral assemblages, you can have immiscible silicate and sulfite melts, and immiscible liquids such as waters, hydrocarbons, etc. And phases could either be pure compounds or mixtures. So it can be such as solid or aqueous solutions, but everything has to behave as a coherent substance. When we talk about C, it refers to the minimum number of chemical components required to constitute the phases in the system. So in geology, usually we'll talk about components in the terms of their simple oxides. So we have SiO2, Al2O3, CaO, etc. And you can also talk about it in the terms of its end member compositions. So we have carbonates such as CaCO3, MgCO3, feldspars, etc. So I'll leave this here for you to have a look at. And if you have any questions about it, do let me know. Finally, F is the number of degrees of freedom within the system. And it's also referred to as the variance of the system. And you will see that in geologic applications, this refers to the number of variables, so pressure and temperature, usually, that can independently be changed without altering the state of the system. So there are three common types of equilibria that are possible. So as we talked about earlier, F is also referred to as the variance of the system. The first one would be invariant. So invariant, in which neither pressure or temperature can be changed on a phase diagram, this is re represented as a singular invariant point. So invariant equilibria, you will find it as a point on the diagram. The second one, the univariant equilibria, in which either pressure or temperature, so pressure or temperature can be changed independently. But to maintain the state of the system, there has to be corresponding change in the other variable. So if you're changing pressure, there will have to be a change in temperature. There has to be a corresponding change in the variable that you're not changing. So on a phase diagram, this would be referred to as a univariant curve. So with invariant, it was a point. For univariant, it would be a curve. Last but not least, we have the divariant equilibria in which both pressure and temperature are free to change independently without changing the state of the system. 
So divariant, you can change both pressure and temperature. And this is a region which is bounded by the conditions defined by the univariant equilibria. So on your diagram, it will be bound by the univariant equilibria. So this region here, these would be your divariant equilibria. So let's have a look at some examples so we can further understand this. Here we have a simple one component example. So we're not starting off with minerals yet. Let's just have a look at water. So this system here is entirely composed of H2O. And the phases represent the three states of matter. So we have liquid here, water, we have solid, and we have gas or steam. So all of these have distinct physical properties. So they must be considered as distinct phases. So we have three phases here. And note that there is only one point on this diagram where all three phases coexist in equilibrium. So if you remember from the slide, pre the slide previously, when you have a point, that is referred to as an invariant point because the pressure and temperature are uniquely specified. It is only at this point that all three phases coexist in equilibrium. So there are zero degrees of freedom. So that is your invariant point. Next, each of the curves represents a chemical reaction that describes a phase transformation. So something going from solid to liquid, which is melt or crystallization, something going from liquid to vapor, which is boiling or condensation, and solid to vapor, which is sublimation or deposition. So there are three univariant curves around the invariant point. So our invariant point was here. We have three univariant curves. So we have the first curve. So we have the first curve here, second curve here, and the third curve here. And it is always the case that for a C component system, there will always be C plus two univariant curves radiating around the invariant point. And there is only one degree of freedom. So univariant, one degree of freedom along each of the univariant curves. So you can independently change temperature or pressure, but to maintain the two coexisting phases along the curve, the second variable must change by a corresponding fixed amount. So if you were to change pressure, you can do that, but it will also have to change the temperature by a corresponding fixed amount. So we've had a look at the invariant point and the univariant curves. Next, we will have a look at the three distinct areas where only ice, liquid, or vapor exists. So, exists. So these are called the divariant fields. So this is the field for water, this is the field for ice, and this would be the field for water vapor. And the temperature and pressure are both free to change within these fields. So if you wanted to change the pressure and temperature, then you can do that within these fields. So let's say you had a pressure and temperature of that amount and you changed it to a higher one, you would still be in the field of water. 
So it will be a bit hotter or a bit colder or maybe a bit compressed or a bit expanded, but it would still be within the same phase. And if we observe here at the end of the boiling curve, separating the liquid to vapor transition, there is a critical point. And this is particularly interesting for this specific phase diagram because beyond this region, the physical chemical properties of water and steam converge to a point where they are identical. And beyond this point, we would refer to it as a supercritical fluid. So that's the simple one component example for water. Let's move on to the simple one component example of Al2SiO5. So Al2SiO5. We've seen this diagram a lot in our discussions about the introduction to metamorphic petrology and I'm pretty sure you'll be seeing this diagram more as we discuss about metamorphic petrology in the future. So this example here is defined by one component. So we have all the phases being completely made of this one component. There are three solid phases shown in this diagram. They're all polymorphs of Al2SiO5, which are andalusite, kyanite, and silimonite. So let's have a look at the different components, the different parts that make this diagram. So we have only one unique place on the diagram where all three phases can coexist. So if you remember, the single point on the diagram is called the invariant point. So the invariant point here is at 3.8 kilobars. and 500 degrees Celsius. So at this specific point, it is an invariant point that has zero degrees of freedom. It is specific and it is a point on the diagram. Next on our list, after we've talked about our invariant point, we have our three univariant curves. So there are three univariant reactions on this diagram where we have andalusite to silimonite. Maybe I need a brighter color. So andalusite silimonite, we have andalusite kyanite and kyanite silimonite. So three univariant reactions on the diagram and they each represent these phase transitions. And in each of these reactions, either pressure or temperature can be changed independently. But again, for the state of the system to remain the same, for the two solid phases to coexist in equilibrium, the other must change by a fixed amount to maintain the assemblage of the univariant curve. So there's one degree of freedom. So for example, if you wanted to change the temperature from 600 degrees to 700 degrees, you would also have to change the pressure correspondingly. So it still lies on this curve. And if you were to change the pressure, for example, from 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, again, you would have to adjust the temperature accordingly so it stays on the curve. All right, so that is the meaning of a univariant curve in this example of Al2 SiO5. Last but not least, there are three divariant fields so we've had our invariant point and our univariant curves. So last on the list is our individual fields. So we have three divariant fields in which only a single mineral phase in sta is stable. So in this field, we have kyanite stable, 
silimonite, and in here we have andalusite. So within these fields, the pressure and temperature can be changed independently without changing the state of the system. So there are two degrees of freedom. So if you wanted to change the pressure here and you wanted the temperature to be somewhere here, you can do that. So it has to be it it has to be within the same field for you to be able to do that. And this is because it has two degrees of freedom. And so that's the example where we have a simple one component diagram. And these principles that you've learned here today can be extended to more complicated binary, ternary, and multi-component systems. So I hope that was a good introduction to help you understand phase diagrams a little bit better. And if you have any questions, do feel free to ask me and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, thank you for your attention. And that is the end of this video.